Hello and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting things. Today, joining us is Jimmy Henderson of uh, Project Minerva. You got it, Project oh, Minerva. Man. It's, it's either, <laughs> no one's quite sure if it's Project Minerva or the Minerva Project. Well, when they started out, it's just Minerva, which is actually an acronym that I can tell you what of it means it in a minute. But um, so it's, you know, capital Minerva, all caps. And some people call that Project Minerva and some people call that Minerva Project. So they eventually just decided, I think, on Project Minerva, because like you said earlier, uh, the Minerva Project sounds kind of like a mad scientist thing. Yeah, the, it's, the, it's like, like the, the subtitle of an X-Men movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it fits in with like Roman mythology, so it'd be perfect for a... Yeah, yeah. oh, absolutely. Um, we should say first, now that we've talked about the name of your project for a while, what you're actually working on, because right. I didn't say anything <laughs> about what you do right. at all. Okay, so the Minerva Project, I'll tell you what the acronym means, but it doesn't really mean much to most people because it's really boring astronomy stuff. Um, it's min is all from the same word. It's a uh, very so poorly it's, done so it's acronym. It's not an acronym it's, at all. Yeah, it's not technically, it's not a legit acronym. <laughs> it's part acronym. It's Miniature Exoplanet Radial Velocity Array. Okay. So like I said, uh, I can tell you what it means, but that probably doesn't mean much to but the average But we got reader. exoplanet in there, which is exciting. Yes, so exoplanet is a really nice uh, red button word for a lot of people interested in science. So you're looking for uh, planets that aren't in our solar system. Yes, so the express goal of the Minerva Project is to find uh, hopefully Earth-sized planets around nearby stars, specifically. Did you say the Minerva Project? Yes. Not Project Minerva. Project Minerva is all <laughs> I told you, the names are so confusing. So Project Minerva, um, its goal is to find Earth-like planets around okay. nearby stars. To me, when I think about exoplanet research, I think about Kepler, which is a space telescope. Kepler uh, finds planets using the transit method, where between us and the star, the, the planet happens to be crossing, which yes. it could be doing a number of other things, but it happens to be crossing. It dims the light of the star a little bit, and then we can say there it's a, there's, a, there's a dimming, and it ha happens multiple times, and we can learn things about this, the planet that way. Absolutely. So the nice thing about the transit system is it's fairly easy to do. You just need a telescope um, that is precise enough to notice like a 1% dip in mm -hmm. brightness and luminosity, which is not that hard. But it's, there's other ways. There are other ways. And one of them is one of the letters in Minerva. Yes. So, well, <laughs> my two, two, two of, of the, the letters, letters, radial okay. velocity, okay. RV, those are two of the letters in uh, Project Minerva. Um, and what that is, is that that's a lot more complicated. It requires um, more expensive equipment and it's, uh, it, involves a lot of kind of complicated physical principles, but most importantly, one principle that isn't complicated that you know, everybody understands, which is um, you know, when you hear an ambulance coming through town, for example, and it's coming towards you, it sounds really, really high pitched, right? When it's right in front of you, it's the, um, it's the actual pitch that mm -hmm. it's making, and then as it's going away, uh, it sounds lower because of the Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. The Doppler effect happens with sound and with light and with any kind of wave. What it does is it increases the frequency of the waves that are you know, being thrown at you. Right. With light, when it moves towards you, um, it shifts the spectrum of the light towards the blue um, because it's higher frequency, or if it's moving away from you, it shifts the spectrum of the light towards the red, which is lower frequency, lower energy. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the idea is like if you take a prism or any kind of light separating device and you break light up, you know, you see that nice rainbow. Um, but from stars, because they have gas in their atmospheres, certain discrete wavelengths of light, depending on what elements are in the atmosphere of the star, get absorbed. And so what you see is instead of like a nice uh, rainbow, like a rectangularized rainbow, you see a rainbow but with little black spots on it. Mm -hmm. And those black spots are absorption lines um, that have been absorbed by the stuff between us and the star. And that's in the star's own atmosphere? Yes, okay. and yeah, the gaseous clouds around the mm -hmm. outside of a star. Um, and as well as the material inside of the star, uh, because photons from stars have to travel from the core of the star, which takes forever, by the way. Um, so what we do um, when you're doing radial velocity measurements is it's a very indirect. Um, you watch, you take a spectrum of the light that you're seeing, and you look for those black lines. Now, if you use the same kind of elements that are in a star, um, like hydrogen is a good one that we use a lot, <laughs> hydrogen lines, because it's hydrogen is everywhere. Um, we know exactly where it should be on the uh, spectrum. But for stars that we take spectrum for, take spectra for far away in outer space, um, 
those lines are shifted because of the Doppler effect. The black line will move to the blue if it's moving towards us, and the black line will move to the red if it's moving away from us. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, so what you do is you use the amount of shift to figure out the velocity of the star towards you or away from you. And then you plot these velocities, and what you get is kind of like a sinusoidal curve, like a wave. Um, and based on the period of that curve and the dip of that curve, you can figure out that there is a planet around that star and how big the planet is and how far away from the star the planet is because you have its orbital period. Uh, so Kepler is a uh, space telescope. Yes, it is, is not on the Earth which anymore. Which is nice, nice for, Kep for yeah. Kepler. Uh, your telescopes are, are Earth telescopes. Yeah, so Project Minerva But you can still do all this amazing stuff. We can. We can't do it as well as Kepler could, but the thing about Kepler is, uh, and missions like Kepler, just like uh, Hubble Space Telescope, once you send it in outer space, it's really, really... I keep saying outer space. I probably sound like a little kid, but it's the funnest word to say. Once you send <laughs> it outside of our atmosphere, um, it's really hard to get back to it to do upgrades or right, fix, yeah. uh, you know, fix them. Yeah, um, it's just like watching New Horizons like arrive with a ten-year-old camera, and I'm just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Everybody's my camera is so much nicer than the camera on that. That's what people don't understand. It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. You have more impressive technology um, on your phone than yeah. we had when we launched Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. Um, but so that's kind of the benefit to ground-based telescopes. The you know the biggest detriment of ground-based telescopes is atmosphere because mm -hmm. you have to look through atmosphere, which distorts light like crazy. Project Minerva's telescopes are located on a very dry mountain in southern Arizona, about 30 miles from the border to Mexico, um, just outside Tucson. Uh, the mountain is basically a huge observatory. Um, there's more missions than just ours there, and actually Harvard Smithsonian owns the mountain. And Harvard University is one of the universities on uh, Project Minerva. and. Uh, so all of our telescopes are there on that mountain, thanks to Harvard. Thank you, Harvard. <laughs> um, um, we are one of the schools for the Project Minerva, obviously. Um, then Harvard, like I mentioned. And there's also Penn State has one of the telescopes. And University of New South Wales in Australia is one of the other telescopes. And we also have a new kind of um, stepchild addition to Project Minerva family, and it's called Minerva Red. And those, uh, that's being run by people from UPenn. Um, and it's kind of a related, similar, but slightly different project. Um, and so all of our telescopes are actually on the same patch of ground down in uh, Arizona. And they're all 0.7 meters, which doesn't mean much to the average person. But when I hear 0.7 meters, I go like, ooh, 0 <laughs> 0 0.7 meters, you say. And it's, they're big telescopes for, a, for a, such a small school to own. The whole thing costs um, between all the universities, bet probably between uh, right around 5 million, maybe between 5 and 10 million for all the telescopes, all the camera. Um, all the construction that had mm -hmm. to be done to put the telescopes there, um, the computer equipment that we had to buy. So uh, it sounds expensive, but that's actually uh, really incredible uh, to be able to do that kind of science for so cheap. And it's mm -hmm. because we bought those four telescopes instead of buying one big one that we're able to do it so cheap. So they sort of all work together to become a big telescope? Yeah, so it's rather communisty, I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically everybody's like, okay, now we're all going to go in eagle on telescopes. <laughs> and then we did, because yeah. scientists don't bicker uh, <laughs> as much. We don't bicker as much. <laughs> Um, so how uh, have you started to have good data be released? Or so basically up till this point, we broke first light with all telescopes on the mountain earlier this year. Um, and since then, we've just been collecting a ridiculous amount of data. I mean, terabytes of data. So you just like go data. from star to star to star to star. Yeah, we. T I mean, every night that you can, taking pictures. Um, and we did that because we're like, well, summertime's going to come around. And it's going to be monsoon season. That'll give us plenty of time to analyze data. So now we're kind of sitting on top of mountains and mountains of data that we're currently working on. Um, we did do data analysis on one set of data. Um, that was a known planet, but its mass was really iffy. We weren't sure what its mass was, and we got uh, a much better constraint on its mass, and it's actually a giant uh, Saturn-sized planet, basically cool. a hot Saturn around a star, around some unnamed star. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing. Stars don't all have cool names like the sun or, <laughs> or like <laughs> Rigel or Sirius. A lot of stars are called like HD 1109, stuff like yeah. that, so yeah. 
They're so uh, I love the ones that have great names, though. Mm. The Sun is is the best name. <laughs> he has the in his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't call him like Rigel isn't the Rigel or the Beetlejuice. As a human, I appreciate all of the hard work the Sun does. Yes, and fusion mm. is hard work. We you aren't very good at it here on Earth. So. But the Sun, I feel like eh, it's got a lot of advantages when it comes to fusion. Just right. having this massive. Well, that brings up the interesting pressure. question of these people that you know like sell naming rights to stars for people's birthday. Oh, yeah. Like there's a there's there's totally a chance there's like in a far more intelligent civilization than humans. Nice. Yeah, and we're like, oh, this dude named it after his dog, Fluffy. So that's what we call your parent star that sustains life on your faraway ancient yeah. place planet. You like know, like it'd be, it'd be, you know, yeah. I, I bet. Do you think the sun has an, another name? Oh, another I'm sure. It, I'm sure it does. Us a name, so at least a serial number. So I'm one of those people that. Um, I mean, a lot of scientists are apprehensive to say it, you know, that like there's probably life uh, somewhere yeah. else in the universe. Um, I, th I mean, the statistics are, are pretty astounding. There's um, somebody out there. There's, there's definitely <laughs> some kind of life somewhere else in the universe, almost certainly. Yeah. The um, question is, are they uh, here to kill us? <laughs> are they here to kill us? That's, well, so oh. answer that question for me first. <laughs> okay, well, let me, yes. just, uh, let me just dig out all the info I have on mankind <laughs> and our tendencies to kill other creatures. I, th <laughs> I think that probably if we ever do, and you know, that the new mission SETI was just, uh, the new installment of SETI anyways, was just approved for funding, which is, it's just a giant mission to find life somewhere else. Uh, I think that if we do find life somewhere else, or if life from somewhere else finds us, uh, chances are they'll probably have a more peaceful, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of civilization. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Cross your fingers. <laughs> Cross your fingers for like but, third rock but from they, the sun type They probably aliens. have named the sun after someone's dog. Maybe. After <laughs> somebody's whatever they have instead of dogs on yeah. their planet. I, I don't know they if probably, they domesticate. They probably don't have. Of course they domesticate. <laughs> if, they have, other animals. if they have, if they have, you know, space telescopes. Well, they maybe have they've given animals. up on domestication. Maybe they've moved back. Maybe they're all vegans now on that. Well, planet. but you don't have to be. <laughs> you don't have to be eating them. That's to true. Be Not everybody to be eats cuddling their dogs. with them and naming yeah. other stars after them. That's true. Not everybody eats their dogs. Quote. Just put that. You can quote me on that. Put that in your lower third. I've had several dogs that I never ate, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, excellent. Uh, now, tell me though, what kind of pets have you had? What kind of pets? So I. I'm had, segueing. My right. My family <laughs> has had dogs and cats. The only pet that I ever had that was my own pet was a, a lizard, a gecko. Do you, can do, you, do you like geckos and lizards and reptile I do. stuff? I love reptiles. Do you want to meet a reptile? I would love to meet okay. a reptile. Let's do that. Good segue. That we never have a good segue. <laughs> you appeared. Um, you were talking about reptiles. No, you were talking about pets that aliens might have. Correct. Are they called aliens? Can I call them aliens? Yeah, no, I don't know what Extraterrestrials, I think, is the PC term. <laughs> Already offending yeah. them. Yep, that's right. You're the first to go. <laughs> oh. um, so you thought maybe they had dogs, but what if they domesticated dragons? Yeah, that would be cool. Do you want to see a dragon? That Shh. Does it breathe fire? Is it very large? I've not can it hurt me? I've not seen them breathe fire. They're very small, and yes, it can hurt you. <laughs> oh, well. It's very small. I feel like, how badly can it hurt me? <laughs> Bite your finger. Okay, then we can see it. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's adorable. Why is your head so big? <laughs> you guys have a large head. I do. What's this? This is a red-eyed crocodile skink. Okay. It yeah. does have a real dragon head. It does, it does. Yeah. Very Skyrim. Yeah. <laughs> so these guys are crocodile skinks because they look like a yeah, yeah. they have those, those big um, scales on the back there. And there's eight species of crocodile skink, um, but red-eyed crocodile skink. Um, yeah, it does have a red eye. Have a red eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, these guys are actually pretty rare. You don't see them a lot, and they're very rare in captivity. Research is really, really limited on everything about them. Where are they from? What do they do? Uh, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon okay. Islands area. Um, they hide very, very well. Um, we have a, a tank, about a 40-gallon tank for them to live in with lots of hides, and I can frequently not find them, mm -hmm. um, even though I know they're in there. How many um, are there? There are two. Would you like to meet the other one? 
Oh, there's, there, there's another one in there? Hold, do you, what, do you want to try and hold well, one? Well, you did tell me that it could it could it, hurt me. Yeah, so what they will do for their defense is, you know, they'll squeak, which is actually pretty darn cute. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because they're they're not happy. Yeah. Um, the other thing is they'll freeze, which he's kind of doing right now. He's, he's, he's not super freaked <laughs> out, but... Um, because he's not squeaking and he's not trying to bite me and he is not defecating all over me. Okay. So I know that he's fairly okay. not too stressed out. So you hold him, just put your finger out. He'll rest his hands on your finger and okay. then put your hand on his back. Yep. So, so is there any right. chance for like planned breeding to make them larger like dragons? Because that would be pretty cool. Whoa. We could do that. Whoa. Yeah. And then when the aliens come, they'll we'll be, be right. like, those people have dragons, so <laughs> let's leave them alone. <laughs> Don't mess with Earth. You, you look like... Dragon riders with perns. I mean, it. you look like a little, you got kind of like a puppy dog eye face. That's such big eyes and big head. Yeah. And very, their crest on the back of their head there. It looks mm -hmm. just like a dragon. It does really look very dragon-like. Yeah. Um, it's cold. Uh -huh. as, they, as, the, as these creatures tend to be. Reptile. So do you know what makes a skink a skink? No idea. In fact, I would not have said this was a skink because of how no. it looks like a lizard. I know. Well, skinks are lizards. Oh, okay. They are lizards, but they're this... It's, it's difficult to study skinks because they are so such a large group mm -hmm. and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Mostly what defines them is they have a cylindrical body, short legs, and their tail can often fall off. Okay. So these guys, they, if you pull on their tail and they're very worried, they will drop their tail. And it can grow back. It doesn't look very pretty. Um, but yeah, skinks are all across the board. Um, okay. A lot of skinks are going to be more burrowy. Mm -hmm. These guys are more arboreal, which means mm -hmm. up in the trees. And uh, they, they hang out up in the trees. They have those long back toes there, mm -hmm. which usually yep. indicates that they're... Tree, tree animals. Yep. Um, so we have Ooh, a male and a doing? female. And she doing all right? Yeah, we okay. just, just started looking at something. Me, maybe. That dark spot over there? Do I? Do, that looks don't. like a nice spot to run and hide? Yeah, don't go there. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> um, males are territorial. You can tell the difference between a male and a female because the males have these little um, raised pores on their back toes here. Oh, wow. And That's they very think specific. That, yeah, <laughs> otherwise they look very similar. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have a little bit of difference in there. Are you falling asleep? Ah, 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 ah. He's the opposite nope, of falling nope, asleep. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, Good. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, I took the gum. You're surprisingly strong. I always feel that way about animals. Stronger than you think? Yeah, especially reptiles, where I'm just like, you're tiny. Why are you so <laughs> able to we can go move? Ahead yeah, you can, you can go back. Here. Go ahead. Oh, nope. Go ahead. Oh, you're cute. Oh, oh she's too oh, used to the freedom. She doesn't want to. Ah, there that you out. go. She just didn't want to be restrained anymore. I understand. I wouldn't want some giant thing holding me, and you and me yeah. staring at me, and yeah. talking about you. Yeah. Um, so these the pores there, though the males, they think that they are actually marking their territory with scent. Okay. Which is pretty cool. A little foot foot scent glands. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Just yeah. Like, That's how I do it. Blech, you're yeah. mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. Yeah, just rub your feet on a, on a person. <laughs> Okay. Number one way to <laughs> number one way to keep a partner faithful. Rub, <laughs> rub your foot stink you guys, on him. You guys won't get along just well. Yes. <laughs> He's my wingman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to put him back because um, this it, this looks to me like he's freezing and yeah. he's just trying to disassociate. So I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and put him back. Okay. Um, we always want to make sure that when we do bring an ambassador out, that um, it's a positive experience. Yeah. So they want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jesse, for coming on. Uh, if you, you want to see more of Jesse and her animals, uh, she has her own YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. Uh, and I'm really excited to learn more about your research and to have that be published. And I'm sure we will <laughs> talk about it on SciShow when you've got lots of stuff to share, which I'm sure is coming up. That's a lot of pressure, but hopefully, yeah, that'd be nice. Well, thank you for yeah, sharing your Absolutely. Yeah, uh, knowledge, uh, which was quite grand oh, and really shucks. exciting. <laughs> oh, <shucks. laughs> I'm flattered. Uh, and thanks to all of you for watching this episode of SciShow Talk Show, which uh, is one of my favorite things we do here on SciShow. If you like SciShow Talk Show, we do it because we like it, and we're glad that you like it too. If you uh, want to help us keep doing it, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow, where we have uh, some perks you can get, some, some rewards, and also you can just help us keep making the show so that you, and also everyone else, can have it. Um, and if you just want to keep getting smarter with us, keep seeing this stuff, you can stick us in your subscription box by going to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribing.